A Parent's Worst Nightmare. The morning of Wednesday, May 8, 2019, started off like any other weekday in the home that Chantel Oakley shared with her three children and boyfriend, Andy McCauley. As the busy mom was preparing to take her sons to school, she noticed that Andy had already left for his construction job. Just before heading out the door, she had peeked in on 15-year-old Riley but saw that she was not in her room. Since it wasn't unusual for her daughter to get up early and walk to school, Chantel had thought nothing of it as she packed the boys into the car and set out on what was to be a day that would change all their lives forever. Later that afternoon, Chantel received a communication from the school informing her that her daughter had failed to show up for her scheduled classes. After hanging up, she had tried Riley's cell phone, but the call went straight to voicemail. Her sense of panic rising at an alarming rate, she had then contacted her daughter's friends, only to learn that no one had seen or heard from her all day. A look at her social media revealed that she hadn't been active since the previous evening. Certain at this point that something was terribly wrong, Chantel had filed a missing person report with the Berkeley Springs, West Virginia Police Department. When Riley's father was notified that his daughter was missing, he had immediately voiced his concerns that she had not disappeared of her own free will. A responsible girl who always put the feelings of others before her own. He insisted that she wouldn't have left without letting either him or her mother know where she was going and when she would be back. To their credit, the local authorities had taken Riley's case seriously from the get-go. A search of her bedroom would confirm their suspicions that the teenager had met with foul play. The space was messy and disorganized, but no more so than that of any other young girl who was too preoccupied with having fun to worry about keeping their room tidy. With Chantel's help, investigators went through the items piece by piece and what they uncovered was not good news. Among the clutter lay her eyeglasses and purse, two things she never left home without. They also discovered her book bag, confirming that she hadn't left the house destined for school. On a more ominous note, an examination of Riley's bed revealed bloodstains on the sheets and comforter. Spatters were also found on the interior of the bedroom door. Subsequent DNA testing would confirm that the blood was Riley's. When detectives tried to pinpoint her location by pinging her cell phone, they discovered that the device was turned off. According to those who knew her best, making herself unreachable would have been out of the question for the teenager who was glued to her phone day and night. The timeline of events leading up to Riley's disappearance showed that the last person known to have contact with her in person was her grandmother, who had seen her alive and well at 7 o'clock on Tuesday evening. A few hours later, Chantel had returned home from one of the two jobs she held down to keep the family afloat and noticed that Andy was out cold in the living room, though she would later say that she suspected that he had been pretending to sleep for her benefit. Figuring that her children were safely tucked away in their beds, she had retired for the night. A look into Riley's phone activity on the evening she went missing revealed that she had exchanged messages with friends for a while before signing off. At around 11 o'clock, she was active again, sending a chilling text to her boyfriend Hayden that read, Andy is in my room. I'm scared. Unfortunately, having already fallen asleep, he wouldn't see the message until later that morning and by then, it was too late. Suspecting that he held the key to finding Riley, detectives brought 41-year-old Andy McCauley in for questioning. The way he remembered it, he had last seen his girlfriend's daughter sometime between 9.30 and 10 o'clock when she told him she was turning in for the night. He was adamant that whatever happened to her after that was just as much of a mystery to him as it was to everyone else. What investigators knew that he didn't was that Riley's cell phone records showed that he had called the teenager at 3 o'clock, 3.34, and 3.52 a.m. when he claimed to have been sleeping. Curiously, he had used the asterisk 67 feature to conceal his identity. Fortunately, technology and all its wonders enabled authorities to sidestep his attempts to hide his questionable behavior that night. It was also learned that Riley had tried to FaceTime with Hayden around 5.15 a.m. but he had been unavailable. What she needed to tell him at that hour will never be known, but it has been speculated that she sensed that trouble was brewing and needed someone to talk to. When investigators spoke to Macaulay's co-workers, they found them to be a font of information. The men who picked him up on the morning of May 8 for their usual carpool recalled that he had been up and raring to go when they arrived at his residence. They would have thought nothing of it had it not been for the fact that it was the first time they could remember that they didn't have to wait for him to get ready. They added that the workday had barely begun when Macaulay borrowed a company truck and left around 9 o'clock, 
saying that he had some errands to run and would be right back. As the day ticked away, he finally reappeared at two o'clock in the afternoon. When detectives attempted to track Macaulay by using his cell phone as a guide, they were disappointed to find that it had remained stationary all day. Not nearly as inept as he looked, he had done the unprecedented and left the device at home. Though he insisted that he had simply forgotten to grab it as he hurried out the door, the lucky oversight had certainly worked to his advantage. Investigators tasked with going over Macaulay's work truck with a fine tooth comb were overwhelmed by the stench of decay emitting from the bed. They also detected traces of lime, a chemical compound that can be used to hasten decomposition. Cadaver dogs would later confirm their suspicions that the vehicle had been used to transport a dead body. Even as Macaulay's story was being picked apart, a team of over 300 volunteers were searching high and low for any signs of the missing teenager with the aid of specially trained tracking dogs. On May 16, eight days after Riley was last seen, the hopes of finding her alive were put to rest. After viewing CCTV footage of the Dodge truck Macaulay had taken from the construction site traveling up a mountain road and back down again on the morning of the 8th, searchers descended upon the area. Upon being drawn to a spot where buzzards were flying overhead, they discovered the decimated remains of a young girl lying on a hillside in Tuscarora Pike. A tentative identification of the clothing found at the scene indicated that the body was that of Riley Crossman. Not far from the grim discovery lay an odd assortment of screws and other remnants from a construction site, including industrial-sized trash bags. An eagle-eyed investigator noted that they had seen similar items scattered in the bed of the work truck Macaulay had taken off in the day after Riley went missing. Splotches of drywall mud were also found on the right side of her body. Growing increasingly weary of playing cat and mouse with a man they believed to be a cold-blooded killer, authorities charged Macaulay with Riley's murder. While he sat in jail awaiting trial, they got to work building an ironclad case. Prosecutors theorized that Macaulay had entered Riley's bedroom more than once on the night she died. Known to be aggressive when under the influence, they felt that he had waited until she was off the phone to make his move. The fact that the panties she was found in were torn added credence to the assumption that the attack had been sexually motivated. When she realized what was happening, Riley, who had allegedly never cared much for her mother's boyfriend, had resisted his advances. At some point during the struggle, Macaulay had become violent, striking the teenager with enough force to draw blood. Though her death was ultimately ruled a homicide, due to the body's advanced state of decomposition, the medical examiner was unable to determine the precise means to that end. While it couldn't be proven, blood and saliva found on her bed pillow, led investigators and prosecutors alike to conclude that the teenager had more than likely been suffocated to death. Once the horrific deed was done, with no means of getting rid of the evidence just then, Macaulay had pulled the covers over Riley's body and gone to bed. Knowing that he would have unsupervised access to a truck in the morning, he decided to put off moving her until after the rest of the family headed out for the day. Since Riley almost always left before everyone else, he gambled that her mother wouldn't check in on her before leaving with the boys, which was exactly what happened. When everything seemed to fall in place just as he had hoped, he was certain that he would get away with murder. At around 9.30 a.m., he had backed the truck up to the house on Greenway Drive and loaded Riley's body in the back end. He had then driven to Tuscarora Pike to dump her remains in the woods. Confident that he had covered all the bases, he hadn't taken into account that his movements were being captured on security cameras. First as he passed by a school and later at a store facing the road leading to the mountain where the body would be found much sooner than he had expected. When the footage was brought to his attention, he asserted that he had borrowed the truck for a couple of hours not to hide a body, but rather to purchase cocaine. After being informed that his route had been the same one used by Riley's killer, he changed his story. In this latest version of the truth, he claimed that he had gone to the mountain to shoot up. Though confessing to one crime to cover another was a novel idea, detectives had seen right through his charade. In October of 2021, after two long years of legal wrangling, a Morgan County jury found Macaulay guilty of first-degree murder in the senseless slaying of Riley Crossman and sentenced him to life in prison. He was also convicted on a separate count of child abuse resulting in death, for which he received a second life sentence. Though the defense team had filed a motion asking that their client be allowed to serve the sentences concurrently, which would have opened a window for his future release, the judge who had overseen the case dismissed the request. 
Instead of taking the chance that Macaulay could one day be unleashed upon an unsuspecting public, Circuit Court Judge Deborah McLaughlin ruled that the sentences would run consecutively, all but ensuring that Riley's killer will spend the rest of his life behind bars. While knowing that the individual who took Riley's life would never be able to hurt anyone else had brought a measure of comfort to those who knew and loved the warm, friendly teenager, it didn't change the sad fact that they would be forced to face a future that she would never know. Finding it unbearable to live under the same roof where her daughter died at the hands of her former boyfriend, Chantelle packed up her sons and moved to an undisclosed location. The house, tainted by the events of that dreadful spring night, was demolished in 2021. Although the world will never know the woman Riley would have been, it was clear to everyone in her circle that she was reaching for the sky and would have achieved her goals if only time had allowed. A talented singer, dancer and artist, Riley had excelled at everything she put her mind to. Funny, smart and imperfectly perfect, she was a force to be reckoned with. Whether her determination to live life to the fullest came naturally or from an intuitive belief that her days would be short, in the end, she had made the most of every precious moment. It wouldn't be cruel and unusual to hope that his victim's final moments haunt Macaulay for the next thirty or so years, or however long his presence darkens this earth. In the scheme of things, it would be a small price to pay for his crimes, all things considered.